Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Spokane City Council meeting for October 4th. Madam Clerk, would you please read the roll? Council President Biggs? Here. Council Member Burke? Here. Council Member Cathcart? Present. Council Member Kinnear? Present. Council Member Mum? Here. Council Member Stratton? Here. Council Member Wilkerson? Present. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right. And I just wanted to start by acknowledging that I am back running the meetings. I'm very pleased to do so and feeling good. And I wanted to give special thanks to Council President Pro Tem Candace Mum for running the meeting so effectively the last several weeks and for all the support I had from staff and uh, council members. Um, it's great to be back. Um, so we're going to start off. We have uh, three proclamations this evening, and the first one is Filipino American history. Councilmember Cathcart is going to read that, and I believe that uh, hopefully we have Ben Cabildo who is going to uh, accept it. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you, Council President. Situated here. Uh, whereas the earliest documented proof of Filipino presence in the continental United States was the date of October 18, 1587, when the first Luzones Indios set foot in Morro Bay, California, and the Filipino American National History Society recognizes the year of 1763 as the date of the first permanent Filipino settlement in the United States in St. Malo Parish, Louisiana. And whereas Filipino Americans make up one of the largest excuse me, largest Asian American ethnic groups in the United States today. And it is important to promote and reflect on Philippine history and culture to provide all Americans with the opportunity to hear about and appreciate the contributions of Filipino Americans. And whereas the contributions of Filipino Americans have enhanced the freedom, prosperity, and greatness that America continues to enjoy today. And locally, the Filipino American Association of the Inland Empire enriches our community by promoting and preserving Filipino culture and heritage through the events and celebrations. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, mayor of the city of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim October 2021 as Filipino American History Month. And I will turn it over to Ben Cabildo if he is on the call. No? no. Yes, I'm here. Oh, wonderful. Ben, would you like to say a few words? Sure, sure. Um, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry to say that uh, our president, Christine Biador, cannot be with us because of her work schedule. So on behalf of the board of directors of the Filipino American Association of the Inland Empire, I would like to thank Mayor Woodward and our city council for the proclamation recognizing October 2021 as Filipino American Heritage Month. The Filipino American Association of the Inland Empire is honored to accept this proclamation, and we are honored to serve our, Sp our Spokane community, in particular, our Filipino compatriots in our region. Our association is one of the oldest nonprofit ethnic social organization in Spokane. We were formerly established over 34 years ago, June 12, 1987, by a group of civic-minded Filipino compatriots um, led by Mrs. Norma Gavin. We were established with a mission to preserve and promote Filipino culture and heritage to our Spokane community. Having an organization is very important for our compatriots as well as the, gen the community in general. For our Filipino community, having an organization representing them create a sense of belonging, a sense of ownership, and a sense of empowerment to participate and do good in the general community we live, work, and play in. Um, we, we help enrich the Spokane by sharing our culture and heritage with the general community. And we do this through education, by way of public workshops on Filipino culture, 
cultural dances performed by our Filipino dance group called Silangan Dancers. In schools and universities, adult care facilities and retirement homes, and in the streets of Spokane through our participation at the annual Lilac Parade, Unity in the Community and the Valley Fest. We are also uh, proud of showcasing our Filipino jeepney, one of the most common and used transportation in the Philippines. Yes, Spokane is one of the one of the only five cities in the United States lucky enough to procure this authentic cultural vehicle for everybody to enjoy. So for over 30 years, we also have been involved in countless social, humanitarian, and civic work throughout the Spokane County as well as internationally. And then that is FAAIE in a nutshell. And I want to once again thank you so much for, um, for having us join your meeting as well as for having us um, serve our Spokane city and county. And thank you very much for your work. Thank you, Ben, so much for joining us this evening and sharing all the great things that your association has been involved with. It really has enriched our community. Thank you. And next, turning to public safety awareness, Councilmember Kinnear is going to read that um, proclamation, and she will be joined in accepting that by Fire Chief Schaefer and Assistant Police Chief Lundgren. Councilmember Kinnear. Thank you. And I I believe it's just Assistant Chief that's going to be on this, uh, accept, accepting this. Whereas the City of Spokane is committed to increasing and improving public safety by fostering a healthy and compassionate community where all people feel safe, empowered, and welcome. And whereas the Spokane Police Department dedicates October to building partnerships to better the lives of our community members as a whole, and that every officer has a role in contributing and engaging with those they come into contact with to improve their situation. In accordance with Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the SPD is committed to protecting victims of domestic violence and holding offenders accountable, supporting the work of the public of the Spokane Regional Domestic Violence Team to stop the violence and stop the silence and end the violence. And whereas in accordance with National Fire Prevention Month, the Spokane Fire Department dedicates the month of October to educating citizens on the importance of fire prevention and life safety issues. This year's Fire Prevention Week campaign, campaign theme, Learn the Sounds of Fire Safety, will be observed October 3 through 9 as a continued effort to remind the public of the importance of learning the different sounds of smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. And now therefore, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim October 2021 as Public Safety Awareness Month. So Assistant Chief, would you like to say a word, few words about this? If I can get unmuted, I, I would. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of uh, Chief Meidel, who unfortunately wasn't able to be here tonight, um, and the men and women of the Spokane Police Department, we would like to thank uh, Mayor Woodward and the members of the council for this proclamation. Uh, public safety for us is, is every month, but uh, to call it out, uh, particularly this month, is, is certainly, I think, top of mind. Um, I'd also like to extend the invitation to uh, first time event that we're going to have here in Spokane on Saturday. It's going to be October 9th uh, from 10 to 2. It's called Faith in Blue. It is a national effort that we are uh, very glad to welcome for the first time here. Uh, and it's based on the premise that strong communities are built on mutual respect and understanding. So it'll be a community event. We're going to have um, some cars and uh, equipment for people to see. We'll have uh, employees. The chaplaincy will be there. I think that the Spokane Police Foundation is actually uh, is going to be providing some food as well. So I'd, I'd like to invite all of you that, that might be able to uh, attend on Saturday. It should be a good event. It'll be right here at the Public Safety Building on the east side of the building in the turnout by tomorrow. 
And uh, once again, thank you. I see that um, Chief Schieffer is here. I apologize. I didn't know you were going to attend. Do you want to say a few words? Well, I think Justin did a really good job. I, we uh, we appreciate the faith and that the council and the mayor has us and our our service and our commitment to the community that we're sworn to protect to a, to be able um, to live in a community where uh, we are respected and we are supported means a lot to our people. So. Like Justin said, the women and men of uh, our organization are equally thankful for everything that that you do and your service, and will continue to spend a lot of time throughout the month. This this week, especially, we're in all of the Spokane public schools, private schools, and working throughout the community to spread the message of Fire Prevention Week this week. So, thank you. I hope you have a good meeting tonight. All right, and that brings us to our third and final proclamation on the Arts and the Humanities, Council Member Karen Stratton, and it's gonna be accepted by Melissa Huggins from Spokane Arts. Council Member Stratton. Thank you. Whereas the Arts and Humanities embody much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind, and cities and states have celebrated the value and importance of culture in the lives of Americans and the health of thriving communities during National Arts and Humanity, Humanities Month for several years. Whereas it is the goal of National Arts Partners to use this month to focus on equitable access to the arts at local, state, and national levels, encourage individuals, organizations, and diverse communities to participate in the arts, allow governments and businesses to show their support of the arts and raise public awareness about the role the arts and humanities play in the communities and in our lives. Whereas the coronavirus has had a devastating impact on America's art sector with 99% of produ producing and presenting organizations have canceled events and artists being among the most severely affected segment of the nation's workforce. Yet, notwithstanding this fact, the arts have helped collectively lead us throughout the darkest times of this pandemic, lifting our spirits, unifying communities, and jump-starting the economy. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim October 2021 as Arts and Humanities Month in Spokane and encourage our community members to celebrate and promote the arts and culture in our city and participate in arts and humanities events, not just this month, but year round. And it's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Huggins, who is the Director of Spokane Arts. Um, I serve on that board and I have to tell you that Melissa is probably one of the most hardworking, smart, intelligent, community-minded individual that I've ever had the opportunity to work with. So Melissa, thank you for all your work. And I'm going to give you the floor now to say a few words. Well, that is an incredible introduction that I don't know that I can live up to, but I feel honored to be here to uh, accept the proclamation and, and uh, on behalf of the entire cultural community. Um, thank you, council members and Mayor Woodward for recognizing the importance of arts, humanities, and creativity. Um, as you know, Spokane Arts' mission is twofold. We provide direct programs and services in arts and culture for the community to enjoy, everything from murals and sculpture to poetry, music, film and performing arts programs and we're really proud of that work. The other half of our mission is equally important. We exist to support and promote the whole cultural community so that everyone in the region knows what's going on and can access and attend whether it's in person or virtual. So with that in mind I wanted to just quickly spotlight a couple of resources for the community. Uh, Spokane Arts has an events calendar on our website and that's the best way to find arts uh, upcoming events. It's at spokanearts.org slash events, and we're adding more every day. So if there's anything you'd like us to promote, uh, there's an easy form on the website to 
to share that info. We've also partnered with the Inlander to spotlight upcoming arts and culture events. So you can pick up a physical copy, you can read it online, check their e-blast. Uh, you'll find good info about Arts Month, and you'll also see some beautiful artwork by local artist Vanessa Swenson, who designed all the Arts Month materials, promotional materials. And then lastly, Spokane Arts received a grant from Anovia to help promote the performing arts since they were particularly hard hit by the pandemic. And they're all working really hard to make sure audiences feel safe and everybody is respectful so that we can all get back to enjoying concerts, plays, dance, poetry, comedy, improv, and so much more. So thanks to that grant, we were able to do some marketing that's rolling out now so you'll start to see and hear um, those messages to remind everyone how many exciting options there are to choose from um, and just kind of serve as a reminder that the local performing arts could really use um, everyone's support, whether that's making a donation directly to your favorite performing arts organization, buying a ticket to one of their events, supporting a live stream from home, you know, whatever feels right for each person. Um, so thank you again, Council Members and Mayor Woodward, for recognizing the importance of arts and culture to our region's uh, economy, well-being, and quality of life. Thank you again for having me. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Melissa, for all that you do and all that your organization does to enrich the city and our community members. Um, that uh, does it for proclamations. We have one uh, board and commission appointment. Madam Clerk. Appointment of Edward Bruya to a four-year term on the Spokane Public Facilities District Board to serve from October 5, 2021 to October 4, 2025. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right, Mr. Bruyer is appointed to the Public Facilities District and just in time. They've got a meeting, important meetings coming up. Um, that brings us to our legislative agenda. I'm gonna go slightly out of order, Madam Clerk, and that is I'm gonna put the first special budget ordinance um, on public safety. I'm gonna wait on that one until we get to the special consideration okay. at the end, but go ahead and start with the second special budget ordinance and we'll just go from there. Cool. Ordinance C-36107, General Fund, one, increase appropriation in the Office of Police Ombudsman Department by $29,200. A, $29,200 of the increased appropriation is provided solely for salary and benefit increases related to the change in salary grades for the police ombudsman and deputy police ombudsman positions. This action allows additional appropriation for salary and benefit increases due to the change in salary grades for the affected positions. All right, and we have uh, two community members um, who have signed up to testify. The first is Nicolette Ockeltree. If you'd like to hit star three, Nicolette. All right, welcome Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. Good evening, Council. I'm delighted to see the increase in funding for the Ombudsman Office. In theory, the OPO plays an essential role in assuring, ensuring uh, transparency and civilian oversight of the Spokane Police Department. However, as we are all aware, there have been roadblocks mitigating their efficacy in the past. I am hoping that as we approach the renegotiation of the new police guild contract, that one of the things that you guys consider is actually removing the OPO from the police guild contract entirely. I believe it's the only way to ensure that the OPO remains truly independent and that uh, they aren't hindered from doing their job. I did a public records request for all of the body cams from the George Floyd protests last year, and it's deeply disturbing to me that the OPO is being prevented from doing an honest and thorough investigation and review of the police behavior that day. So thank you again for um, voting for this uh, uh, increase in funding, and uh, I hope that you take some of these thoughts into consideration. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and then I'd like to invite Curtis Robinson to hit star three. All right, welcome to City Council. Curtis, you have up to three minutes. Okay, yeah, that sounds kind of scratchy, so it sounds like I'm, I'm on. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay, so uh, 
I want to say uh, welcome back, uh, President Beggs, and uh, may you and all the uh, rest of the city council members continue to have some great forward-moving mental, mental and physical health in these challenging times. And as I hold the position of the uh, commissioner uh, for the Criminal Justice Training Commission, I am not here to speak in an official capacity on their behalf, yet uh, I do hold the position of first vice president for the Spokane NAACP and am acting president in, uh, while, pre while uh, uh, Ms. Duncan recovers from her emergency surgery. So a lot of that going around. Um, on the issues of uh, C098 and 107, uh, I must state that, I, uh, that um, I must make it very clear that it makes little sense in the age of moving towards visible, a visible corralling and lifting up of meaningful accountability for Washington state law enforcement that has a uh, direct impact uh, on public safety to grant uh, the request for additional municipal funding. And uh, it makes much more sense to hold back on that and, and continue to move forward in granting the request for additional funding for the Ombudsman Office. Uh, in this time of where the clearing call has become very clear that more funding for training resources, transparency and accountability, not weapons, is really the, the, the sound that's coming out, the request from the community and uh, what we and my, I myself am asking you to uh, go ahead and act on, especially since the new laws do not currently stop law enforcement from mindfully using what they have uh, in their arsenal, so to speak, at this time. Um, yet we do have restrictions revolving around the ombudsman's ability, as has already been stated, to uh, effectively and meaningfully do their job, funding being one of those important resources. And with that, I'll close. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And that's the end of uh, requested community comment on the special budget ordinance increasing funding for the Office of Police Ombudsman. Um, any council commentary? All right, not seeing any. Um, we'll go to a roll call. Um, council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I, Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. And for those of you watching, special budget ordinances uh, require a vote of supermajority of five. Uh, let's go to the next one. Ordinance C-36108, General Capital Improvements Fund, one, increase appropriations by $39,500. A, increase in appropriations to be used towards the remodel for the Gardner Detective Building used by the Spokane Police Department. B, budget increase to come from fund balance reserves. C, total estimated project cost of $59,500. This action allows additional appropriation for the remodel of the Gardner Building as, is, as it, is, it no longer meets department needs. And um, if it wasn't clear, this, the police department has an accumulating fund for capital improvements and it comes from that. So it's not additional funding, it's from a fund that exists. Uh, we have one community member who's requested to testify and that would be Nicolette Ockeltree, if you wanna hit star three. All right, welcome Nicolette, you have up to three minutes. Thank you. Um, I just had one question when I read this, and that was, how was Sean Cole Construction selected as the construction company that would do the remodeling of the Gardner building? Was an RFP put out? If not, why not? Thank you, Nicolette. I don't have the answer to that question. I don't know if there's anyone still on the line from police. I don't see anyone, so. I don't have that question, but we can look into it. Um, any council commentary on this special budget ordinance? All right, seeing none, I'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Council Member Burke. Nay. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. Okay. 
That passes six to one. Uh, next uh, item is Fister. Ordinance C36109, Fire EMS Fund, one increased revenue by $478,061. A, revenue received by the department as reimbursement for costs of staffing the Northeast Tri-County Health District Vaccination Clinic. Two, increase appropriations by $478,061. A, increase in appropriations to offset costs of staffing the North. East Tri-County Health District vac Vaccination Clinic. B, costs related to overtime, backfill, and travel lodging. This action budgets for staffing a vaccination clinic for the Northeast Tri-County Health District. All right, and this essentially, um, we have mutual aid agreements and our department was requested to staff vaccine clinics in the Tri-County area north of here. And we did so, and under the agreement, uh, we get reimbursed for our staffing costs of the people going up there. Any staffing costs needed to backfill, any overtime, uh, so that we are made whole. This simply does the accounting to allow us to do that. Uh, there's no public uh, commentary requested. Any council commentary? All right, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mo. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai, Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. Next. Ordinance C36110, Fire EMS Fund, one, increased revenue by $86,344, A, revenue received by the department from insurance settlements resulting from damage claims to department vehicles, two, increase appropriations by $86,344, A, increase in appropriations of the apparatus vehicle repair and maintenance budget to offset the increased cost of repairing damaged department vehicles. This action budgets for costs to repair damaged department vehicles. All right, there's no public comment. Again, pretty self-explanatory. It simply allows us to take revenue from insurance companies making payments for their drivers crashing into our vehicles. Uh, any council commentary? All right, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Burke. Aye. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. Um, did you ask me, Council President? I aye. did. I am so sorry. <laughs> Council Member Wilkerson's an aye. Aye. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Um, passes seven to zero. Um, all right, next item. Ordinance C thirty six one one one. General fund, number one, increased revenue by $2,100,000. A, $1,575,000 of the increased revenue represents the estimated amount to be reimbursed by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. B, $525,000 of the increased revenue represents the anticipated use of the city's contingency reserve. Two, increase appropriation by $2,100,000. A, $2,100,000 of the appropriation is provided to the Engineering Services Department solely for the purpose of emergency work related to the Clark Avenue landslide. This action funds necessary operation expenses related to the emergency situation created by the Clark Avenue landslide. There's no public comment. Um, there are no Council Member Mum. Hello, yes, I did uh, mention that it's a 3.30 briefing and would uh, circulate a suggested little amendment to the um, language here under Section 1A, B, which would be to replace the word contingency with the word unappropriated. So the contingency reserves are, in my mind, to be protected um, because of our bond rating. And I do understand that our, our CFO uh, has reasoning why you want to take um, certain restricted funds and use those instead of the unappropriated. But in order to keep our bond rating solid, I would make an amendment to replace the word contingency for with unappropriated. Would you like to make a motion to suspend the council rules that would allow that? We can't hear you. 
Would you like to make a motion to suspend the council rules that would allow us to make that um, amendment? Certainly. I would move to suspend the rules in order to make that amendment. I apologize. Well, that's all right. Second. All right. Any discussion about the motion to suspend the rules? All right. All those in favor of suspending the rules indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? All right. The rules are suspended for the purposes of uh, entertaining an amendment at our legislative session. And would you like to, well, you've already made the motion to change the word uh, contingency to- I can do it again. I'll make okay. the motion again. Yeah. Okay. I would move that we would re uh, replace the word contingency under section 11B and replace it with unappropriated. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. Second. Any discussion about the amendment? All right. All those in favor of the amendment indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right. It is now amended to reflect a different um, funding source. Any discussion by council? about the overall special budget ordinance as amended. All right, council member Wilkerson. First of all, I support it, but I support the change going forward. We all know that work needs to get done before winter sets in, but where our resources come from and where they go is really important. So uh, I support the amended. Councilmember Stratton. I have a quick question. I think I know the answer. I just want to confirm it. Um, so down the road, there may be a possibility that funds would be replaced by FEMA. Is that correct? Yes. The administration believes okay. that 75% of it will be promptly okay. funded by FEMA. Okay. Thanks. Any other council commentary before we vote? All right, we'll have a roll call on the special budget ordinance as amended. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Burt. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. Passed seven to zero. We had an emergency ordinance, but we deferred that until the 18th. We had one resolution about parking kiosks that we tabled indefinitely at 3.30. And we also deferred resolution 69 to the 18th as well, I believe. So that gets us to, we have, um, a considerate, we have special consideration of <clears throat> purchase of 100 pepper ball, less lethal launching systems, and 77 ballistic shields, and then um, a special budget ordinance. So why don't you read the special budget ordinance, and then go ahead and read those considerations. And then uh, we have quite a bit of testimony on, on those, and we'll just take those once we've read all of them. We'll vote separately, but the Testimonies um, overlapping. So we'll go ahead and do that after Madam Clerk reads those three. Ordinance C36098, Public Safety and Judicial Grants Fund, one, increased revenue by $213,800. A, $213,800 of the increased revenue in the police department is a distribution from the state to assist with one time costs related to law enforcement and criminal justice related legislation enacted between January 1, 2020 and June 30, 2021. Two, increase expenditures by $213,800. A, increase in appropriations will be used to procure less lethal pepper ball launching system and shields. This action procures additional safety equipment and tools to adhere to new state legislation deferred from September 27, 2021 agenda. S1, purchase of A, 100 pepper ball less lethal launching systems in compliance with police reform house bills 1310 and 1054. $67,931.53 funded through legislation implementation funds 
and B-77 ballistic shields along with carrying bags utilized by NASPO contracts 164720-03720, 145,867 dollars funded through legislation implementation funds deferred from September 2021 agenda. All right, and we have a, a little over a dozen people who have signed up to testify on one or more of these. I'm just gonna go in the order that you're signed up and you'll have up to three minutes. And again, if you happen to be watching this instead of listening on your phone, please switch to the phone because there is a delay of about 20 seconds or so, so we might miss you. Um, so the First person is gonna be Andrew Rolls, and then after Andrew is Colleen Gardner and then Kim Schmidt. So, Andrew, if you'd like to hit star three. All right, welcome, Andrew. You have up to three minutes. Yes, thank you, Council President. Um, I'm Andrew Rawls, Vice President of the Downtown Spokane Partnership, and uh, I just wanted to provide a, a brief statement in support of the allocation of funds to purchase the pepper, pepper ball launching systems and ballistic shields. Uh, the recommendation from the police department is an, import, an important response to the legislative changes from this past session. Uh, the systems provide less than lethal capacity for our officers, which is effective and provides standoff distance between suspects and officers, keeping both safe. Uh, the loss of other non-lethal options due to state legislation creates a gap, a gap that these systems readily fill, and they're well within the intent of the legislature and they allow officers to exercise a low level of force in order to bring uh, dangerous situations to a rapid end. And thank you very much. All right. Thank you, and if you could hit star three to lower your hand. Uh, next up is Colleen Gardner, then Kim Schmidt, and then Nicolette Ockeltree. So Colleen, if you'd like to hit star three. All right, welcome Colleen, you have up to three minutes. Can everybody hear me? We can. Okay, I just want to say that, first of all, I'm not here representing any group or organization that many of you know I belong to or any of the hats that I wear. I'm speaking specifically as a citizen. I know there are folks that are passionate on both sides of this issue, but I would like to offer my perspective and support for the purchase of this equipment. We are all familiar with the Say Something, See Something campaign. If, as an unexpected observer, you come upon two people that are having very heated argument on a public sidewalk, and it appears that one or both may be in dangerous situation that could easily escalate, what would you do? Under these circumstances, an innocent bystander, we have four possible choices. You can walk away, not my problem, don't want to get involved. You can immediately start videoing on your phone. You can dial 911. Last, but certainly not prim the primary choice most of us would make, intervene. What you are doing, <clears throat> except in choice four, is allowing a barrier between the matter and yourself, in other words, self-protection. You also have had the time to consider your options and decide which one you will follow through with. Well, in the case of a police officer, they don't have the time or the options. They can't walk away. They can't take out their phone and video. They can't call, call 911. They are 911. Their choice is option four, intervene. We ask for police reform, and yet we are hesitant to give the police the tools or equipment to do what we expect and ask them to do. You would not send a firefighter into a fire without a hose or appropriate safety gear, hence it would make sense that you would not send an officer into an unknown situation without the proper equipment to protect themselves and the public. We have asked for reform and now they are asking for the tools or equipment to implement de-escalation tactics that many have asked for, but we are reluctant to give them the necessary tools to do exactly what we ourselves asked for. To me, this is a no-brainer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen. And if you could hit star three and lower your hand. And then I'd like to invite Kim Schmidt to hit star three to raise your hand. After Kim, it's Nicolette and then Riley. Welcome, Kim. You have up to three minutes. Good evening, Council. Um, I want to take a moment to remind everyone that 
Less lethal does not necessarily mean safe. The CDC lists blindness, glaucoma, immediate death due to severe chemical burns to throat and lungs, and respiratory failure as side effects of long-lasting or large doses of riot control agent. The Spokane Police Department would like to purchase 100 of the FN-303 projectile launchers. The warning for the FN-303 from the manufacturer's website goes as follows. Warning, use with extreme caution, not intended for recreational use. Misuse may result in injury or death. Avoid aiming at face or head. Read operator's manual before use. Instruction required before use. All operators of the FN-303 less lethal system must be certified by the FN training team prior to deploying either less lethal system. So I wanna pose a few questions that are rhetorical in nature as I am aware this is not a question and answer session. First, I would like to know why the department needs 100 of these projectile launchers. Will every officer be equipped with an FN-303 for their daily duties? Second, I wanna know if Spokane officers will be completing the appropriate manufacturer certified training. When the purchase of the FN-303 launchers made it into the advanced agenda, a scene from Spokane police body cam came to mind. Last March, during the first Gonzaga couch burning incident, officers were huddled up to discuss how they could best disperse a large group of students that were partying in the street. Officer Maplethorpe's solution was to, and I quote, get some pepper balls out here, end quote. As he is saying that, he is making a gesture with his hands, pretending to discharge an automatic rifle-type weapon from the right to the left of the crowd, seemingly suggested the crowd should be liberally sprayed with pepper balls. Immediately after that clip, you can see a different officer, <clears throat> excuse me, very gleefully loading pepper balls into one of their existing pepper ball guns. He repeatedly exclaims, oh yes, while loading the weapon. That video is available on Stronger Together Spokane's YouTube channel. The video was uploaded on May 4th, 2021, and the mentioned clips begin at 10 minutes and 23 seconds into the video. Ready access to 100 of these weapons not only seems incredibly excessive, but quite frankly, it's disturbing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. If you could hit star three to lower your hand, and I'd like to invite Nicolette Ockeltree to hit star three to raise your hand. And after Nicolette is Riley, and then Sasha Sharman. Welcome, Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. Thank you. Will 100 pepper bullet guns and 77 ballistic shields make our community safer? Only time will tell. What are the hidden costs? How much will it cost to train officers to use these? Uh, proper training is important uh, because less than lethal weapons are only less than lethal if they're used appropriately. How long will they last? I read one article where a police officer said that after 300 shots, the FN-303's accuracy significantly diminishes, thereby increasing the risk of injury or death. What is the projected cost for continued use of these over time, particularly if they're intended to be integrated into day-to-day -day use? How much will it cost to educate the public? Part of de-escalation is calming down the situation, but the very sight of these is not calming. And to the untrained eye, more alarming than the sight of an officer with a handgun drawn. If the OPO had not been stonewalled by the police guilt, preventing them from doing a thorough investigation of the SPD response and activity during the George Floyd protest, we would likely have more accurate information about how effective or not the less lethal weapons were to de-escalate that situation that day. It's clear to me after watching countless hours of body cam footage from that day that there were massive failures in communication and in some instances complete disregard for the safety of civilians and other police officers. I witnessed tear gas being deployed by a few officers while just a few seconds before another officer shouts, smoke them, then push, smoke them, then push. That officer and others thinking a smoke bomb was being deployed, walked into the gas without a mask. Um, that officer and others on camera started to shed all of their gloves and clothing, spitting and coughing into the street from the, irritant, the chemical irritants. I also witnessed officers throwing tear gas canisters across the street and shouting uh, and shooting what I was guessing was rubber bullets or pepper bullets into groups of bystanders, some of which were merely walking to the bus. Innocent citizens in cars drove through the intersection as you hear an officer say, why aren't these streets closed off? 
Jordan Graham, who lives in Spokane Valley, was walking to the bus station in downtown Spokane that night. Um, he obeyed the verbal commands that police officers gave. He had his hands in the air, and yet he was shot in the face with a non-lethal round. Mr. Graham had to have his jaw wired shut. There needs to be more preventative and proactive measures to repair the relationship between police and citizens. And there needs to be more communication between police and the public about what is expected and what the consequences will be if those expectations are not met. In my opinion, from some of that footage especially, they didn't lack weapons. They lacked communication, planning, training, and a desire for public safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nicolette. And if you could hit star three to lower your hand. Uh, next up is Riley. I just have a first name if you want to hit star three, followed by Sasha and then Anwar Peace. All right, Riley, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Hello, thank you. Um, I was going to jump in. Uh, uh, if we can just be frank about this, the violence that police say they're experiencing is really rooted in the very function the police hold in our community. Uh, the assistant chief of police commented today that uh, weapons, uh, not only in high tension settings, but typical day to day interactions um, are de escalating factors. But we have seen time and time again that this is not true. This thinking is what has caused Spokane to be the third most violent police force. This money needs to be invested in supported housing programs with emphasis on community integration. So that would be um, housing that has case managers there and also, you know, pushes people to reintegrate with their community and kind of build those bonds again. Um, I have personally been hit, kicked, cornered, threatened, and had weapons pulled on me, um, more than that, if you can imagine. And I was just a regular person helping people out, and I never once shot a gun. So the question is, why can I, and I'm not a cop, I have none of that training, uh, do what they can't? Um, and that's really rooted in the fact that it's the nature of the job and the existence, uh, existence of our present-day understanding of police. The fear tactics used by police and the media also devalues the necessity for trauma-informed care, uh, which aids to the belief and unfortunate reality of predictable and excusable police violence that we continue to see in Spokane. I will compliment the very few officers out of the many I've spoken to who have pursued additional training on mental health, substance use, and trauma. In those interactions I've had with them, there has never been a violent situation. Every time it has de-escalated, and I couldn't name you one time that it ended in an arrest. Rather, it usually ended in getting somebody the supports that they need. So my question is, why is there continued focus on violent offenders when we have these conversations? Um, especially when we know that oftentimes these are exacerbated by the presence of police. Why do we pretend that police violence is not a uh, direct response to the criminalization of poverty in our city, um, as well as the criminalization of mental health and race? Uh, money must go to de-escalation, which is not weapons. Uh, I really do feel quite foolish saying that weapons are not de-escalation uh, to city council here today. Uh, and furthermore, uh, I would like to vote against uh, the purchase of hundreds of more weapons, and I believe that is just the start. We need to invest in the services that work. Um, we need to acknowledge that the limitations we see with those services can be cured with even half the budget the police get yearly. This money is for reform, reform and I'm waiting to see what further arming this militia will do to create a reformed, nonviolent presence in our community. Uh, to parrot the message of SCAR, which they've been saying for a long time, is that we do not need further weapons. We do not need incremental change. We need Spokane to listen to the people they serve and to acknowledge what will create a safer city for all of us. Our, cor our current model isn't working. Throwing more guns on it is not going to work at all. Um, I ask on behalf of many people who have had a far worse spawn point than you and I uh, talking right now to please do not continue to fail us when it comes to the safety of our community. Thank you, Riley. If you could hit star three and lower your hand. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Sasha Sharman to hit star three. Sasha will be followed by Anwar Peace and then Thomas Bassler. Welcome, Sasha. You have up to three minutes. Hello, Council. Uh, I just, I'm going, uh, I'm going to wait to talk about the pepper ball specifically until uh, we testify on that specific measure because I know it's listed as a separate agenda item. No, right no. Now I just want to no, use this. Just, no, we're doing all of them all at the same time. So it, what, anything to do with pepper so balls, ballistic shields, or the special budget ordinance is the time is now. Okay. Um, 
in that case, I'll try and combine them both both my statements into one. Um, I was expecting more time. It's really ingenuous of counsel to list them as separate, give us two separate options, and then try and cut testimony in half especially when we prepared to have two options. Um, so first off, I'll, I'd like to mention the law. So Bill 1310, um, which is, this says is, is coming in compliance with, uh, the, bit, uh, the agenda item says that the purchase of pepper balls is necessary. It is not, according to the bill. Less lethal alternatives, according to the House uh, bill passed by the state, include but are not limited to verbal warnings, de-escalation tactics, um, uh, and conducted energy weapons, which are these pepper balls. Um, Last summer, we saw tons of meetings with local organizations where we were promised the police would do better. Now, instead of listening to those organizations, you are taking the word of police. Even one of the more liberal members on city council, Councilwoman Wilkerson, mentioned at Public Safety Today that she, quote, spoke to officers who had used these tools as part of her research. All of the promises made last summer that you would listen to the community and get community feedback are being broken with the implementation of, of these measures. It is not a compliance measure as listed in the agenda. It is the next most lethal, least lethal option available for the police, allowable for law, by law. I'll repeat that again. The, instead of trying to implement reforms, the police are trying to find the most lethal, less lethal option they can find. I know you went over this at Public Safety Day today, so I'd like to mention some of the things that we have not seen from the police. First is community feedback, echoing what Kurd, Curtis Robbins said, said earlier today, we do not want more weapons added to the arsenal. This funding should instead be going towards de-escalation training, which would uh, put you in compliance with, which would actually put you in compliance with the law, body cameras, and dispatch reform to get more mental health resources and behavioral health experts on the street. These not only fit the spirit of the bill much better, but they fit what the community has been calling for and what city council and the mayor's office have been promising us last summer but are failing to deliver on now. Uh, uh, FN 303s are not on the agenda right now, so I'll get into those during open forum. Uh, but let me address some of the things about pepper balls that uh, McNabb mentioned at Public Safety today. McNabb claimed that these would only be used in, quote, very rare circumstances by highly trained answer officers, but then not two sentences later stated that they would be in the back of every police cruiser in town. We cannot trust all 140 SPD officers to be highly trained and avoid hitting people in sensitive areas like the head, especially in high-tensity situations. These pepper ball weapons, according to the manufacturer, don't even need to be a direct hit. They hang in the air for 15 minutes and require immediate medical attention, which SPD is historically bad at supplying. Also, according to the Hastings, which did an investigation on less lethal measures, uh, you, McNabb mentioned that there was, has only been one death uh, from, from these, um, these less lethal tools. However, because they are most often used on people who are in and experience in mental health crises and or on drugs, by the time they die, the wounds are not immediately obvious, and medical examiners often list them Mr. as Sharman, excited delirium. Passing them off come to the end of your three minutes. So... Um, but I have right, you sorry. down as open forum to talk about the FN 303, which you are correct is not on the agenda today. They're not the pepper ball launcher. So we'll give you a chance then. Thank you for sharing with us this evening. If you want to hit star three to lower your hand, Anwar Peace. Um, if you want to hit star three and then followed uh, Mr. Peace is Mr. Bassler and then Mr. Hislop. All right, Anwar, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Uh, hello. I wish uh, we could uh, meet face to face. It's difficult to talk over the phone. Uh, I don't have any facial cues. Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you, and we uh, we appreciate the challenges, and really appreciate that you're making the effort to share your thoughts with us. You have up to three minutes. Well, thanks for allowing that. I'm a retired medical doctor. Uh, I'm very appreciative of the police who maintain law and order. I'm amazed at the ignorance and the gross malpractice of the elected officials who support it. The uh, laws undermining our police and undermine the rule of law and are causing the rise in the violent crime and the murder rate. A recent, a recent Spokane Review article discusses the unintended consequences of the legislature's sweeping police reforms. 
I use the word malpractice because the individuals with minimal knowledge of firearms and policing would not have written and supported these laws and would know that such laws would result in an increase in the violent crime rate, including the, sorry about that, the murder rate. Since the outcome was predicted, uh, predictable, the legislature members who supported the sweeping reform laws, which undermine our police, should resign, apologize to the populace, and uh, apologize for these increased, increased death. Uh, may God forgive the people who support the sweeping reform laws for the excess deaths and suffering that they have caused. God bless our police officers, and uh, please provide the police with the tools that the police say they need to keep law and order. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bassler. And then um, Anwar Peace, um, if you would like to hit star three, we'll get you. And then after Anwar is gonna be Bill Hislop and then Chad Wendell. All right, Anwar, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Good evening, Council. The Washington Coalition for Police Accountability, the coalition of statewide impacted families that lobbied the new police reform laws, that, uh, that coalition met on Friday and I asked this question, have they seen any police departments in the state responding to the new laws by buying these pepper ball systems? The, mem the members were unaware of the department, any department in the state getting these pepper ball systems to re replace 50, project, 50 millimeter projectiles, which means SPD would be the first in the state to get these pepper ball systems, even though no public process on how this money was spent, nor public process on it, what, if any, as well as what kind of pepper ball systems will be purchased. When the Seattle Police Department was considering fully implementing tasers department-wide, they had a conscientious community dialogue which involved showing the actual weapon and its capabilities. The community was able to learn that these taser weapons had a built-in multi-layer accountability system in them, which helped ease the fears of those that uh, the tasers would be used to abuse people. As well, to dispel, dispel the fears about the taser, the Seattle Police Chief and the NAACP President shot each other with the taser guns in a way to get buy-in from both police and community about those weapons. None of these community processes have taken place in Spokane regarding the 100 pepper ball system. As well, there has not been a recent update to the police ma manual to address the pepper ball system as well as how and why those pepper ball systems will be uh, uh, currently deployed. As a 21 year police accountability activist, I love me some less than lethal technology. In fact, I've had a lot of them used on me throughout the years, which every time those tools have been used to abuse me. And I find it very fascinating that the legislative intent this past year was to have police stop abusing us which so far the data shows the legislation has been working with less deaths and abuse. And the outliner in the state that needs pepper ball systems is somehow Spokane. So let's take pause on the pepper ball systems for now because there's other better options that should be explored first. In fact, the governor has grant money out there for the bolo wrap system, which, is, which shoots an eight foot tether at 500 feet per second from 10 to 25 feet away, entangling a person with minimum force or risk of injury at the cost of $1,000. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anwar. If you could hit star three to lower your hand, and I'd like to invite Bill Hislop uh, to hit star three, and after Mr. Hislop is Chud Wendell and then Chris Batten. Bill, welcome to Spokane City Council. You have up to three minutes. Thank you, members of the council. Thank you for uh, this discussion here tonight. My name is Bill Hislop. I come as a private citizen, but I also come with a background of being the former United States Attorney for Eastern Washington and the former Vice Chair of the Spokane Use of Force Commission. 
uh, I come as a private citizen very much in support of the police request to purchase the 100 pepper ball launchers and the 75 shields. Uh, this is the recommendation of our professional police department. Uh, they have looked at it and they have studied it and we need to trust the police department. Uh, they know when it is appropriate to use such weapons. Uh, and we, as a, in this council, cannot legislate tonight uh, uh, every instance when such weapons would be necessary or every instance when such weapons should not be utilized. Rather, we have to rely upon the professionalism in the, in, uh, of the police department, and if they misuse, then they will be held accountable, and the process uh, is appropriate for that. The state legislation calls out for use of less lethal weapons. This is very definitely a less lethal weapon and in that category and within the intent of the state legislation. That legislation doesn't call out for the removal of all weapons, which some would support, but which does not, uh, doing that doesn't support public safety. Uh, this summer, uh, in my neighborhood, we sponsored a National Night Out Against Crime event, and we had 50 or 60 residents of my neighborhood attend that. By far, the biggest questions that they had was how does this state legislation reduce their safety and security? They, by far, expect and ask the police department to use all tools in their tool belt to support and protect them. And that's what we intend of the police department. We should not be removing further tools beyond what the state legislation anticipates. I think personally, we should be very proud of our Spokane Police Department. We expect them to protect us we expect them to protect our neighborhoods, and we expect them to use the appropriate amount of force for the particular situation. We Mr. Hislop, you've come to the end of your three minutes. Thank you so much for All right, jo joining us this evening, and we hope to hear from you again in the future. Thanks. Um, and next, I'd like to invite um, Chad Wendell to hit star three and following Mr. Wendell is Chris Batten and then Rick Mendoza. Chad, welcome to City Council tonight. You have up to three minutes. All right, thank you, Council. I support the $213,800 distribution from the state to assist with uh, one-time costs related to law enforcement and criminal justice reform. I currently work as a property manager for several commercial properties within the city of Spokane. Over this past year, I've experienced many changes with our transient population, including a drastic increase in trespassing and a negative impact on public safety. What I'm seeing is what I sense our law enforcement is all experiencing. We're seeing a much more aggressive and unpredictable behavior. This is making life so much more difficult on all the tenants that I manage, as well as impacting my own public safety and the public safety of other property managers. This has led me to file for a concealed carry permit, which I would have never, ever thought I would need to. With the Washington, Washington State uh, 2021 law enforcement reform, we've put our officers in a much more difficult position on protecting the public as well as themselves. The purchase of these less lethal tools are absolutely necessary with the, environment, with the new environment our police officers are operating in. The funding was provided by the state and is no cost to the city of Spokane. We owe it to our Spokane police officers by making sure that each one of us, each one has these platforms and shields readily available. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chad. And if you could hit star three and lower your hand and then uh, Chris Batten, if you could hit star three and raise your hand.
All right. Welcome, Chris. You have up to three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Council. This is Chris Batten. I support the allocation of these funds for the purchase of the Pepperball platform as a less lethal, valuable, and necessary tool to fill the gap. I also support these funds being used for the purchase of the ballistic shields, necessary for the protection and safety of our law enforcement. These funds were allocated by the state specifically for this use. I believe that it is critical that we support our law enforcement and give them the tools and resources to not only do their jobs in protecting our community, but also ensuring the safety and well-being of the officers. Thank you. All right. Um, Rick Mendoza, if you'd hit star three. All right. Rick, welcome to City Council. You have up to three minutes. Thank you very much. I am Rick Mendoza, and I'm very familiar with the uh, with law enforcement in the city and the state, and I strongly support the Pepperball for less lethal platforms and the shields. I believe there's not a person, well, there might be maybe one, that would believe that officers get up in the morning and decide and, and think for themselves, well, I'm gonna, who am I going to shoot today, et cetera, et cetera. Law enforcement in Spokane is highly respected nationwide. Whether you believe that or not, check it out. It's a fact. And I, I strongly support the pepper ball lethal platforms and the shields. And I would ask you, the city council, in your wisdom, to please grant it. The money is allocated. The legislature has spoken. And the officers are trained before they use any type of weapon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Um, I had Curtis Robinson, if you're still there and would like to testify, you can. You testified about the OPO ordinance. You touched on pepper balls briefly, but you did sign up separately for this. So if you're there and you want to testify further about it, hit star three. All right, Curtis, you have up to three minutes. You there, Curtis? Yeah, it's uh, communication is a little. Yep, I'm right here. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, I uh, and I really appreciate the latitude to be able to, you know, touch on something that I did briefly touch on. I think it's also important to really acknowledge, you know, what we're the the important place that we're in as far as creating a shift in the dynamics about how and why law enforcement does a job does its job and the expectation of community around the parameters. Uh, uh, of that position that is really dictated by the community that it's supposed to serve. And I, again, the resounding voice over and over again is that it is time to shift. And that part of that shift also has to be demonstrated by the, uh, uh, by the people in the places of authority of law enforcement about how much they embrace that change, whether or not they agree with it. And I think this represents some of that um, uh, difficult place that, uh, that our law enforcement family is in right now. So it is a place of angst, it is a place of insecurity, and rightly so, because we're calling for them to do things differently than how they've necessarily been trained uh, recently and in their historical culture on how we expect them to operate and engage with the public they are set up to serve. And so one of the things that is very clear to me as we kick this issue around a little bit is where has law enforcement, especially locally, said, hey, we don't necessarily agree with you. We don't necessarily like what you're doing, but we're going to stand with you in it because we also want to be able to do better at our job for you, for the communities that, that we serve and for ourselves. And I can tell you that has not been the resounding response that I have seen, and this actually represents that. I would have felt much better if we had a different dialogue with uh, law enforcement and SPD and everybody when they were saying, yeah, you know, they, they laid it out like that instead of what we have actually seen, which is also incorporate. So if it would have come to the table as, hey, we need more shields and we need more this and that, and we'd like to talk about this, the, the, the munitions piece, that's a lot more reasonably digestible than continuing to hammer the what from my perspective and from those of us that look around and try to evaluate where we're really at as far as a community in this issue, which it looks like a, a heavy-duty blue fragility pushback. 
And we, what we really need to do is just hold space that we need to move through this transportation, hearts and minds locked together and figure out a better way to help our human family do the job with the expectation that we have for them. So again, I support more training, uh, more resources, more help for a law enforcement family in processing where they're at right now and where they need to go, as well as transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of public comment on these matters. I'm going to go to council commentary and then vote first for the special budget ordinance 36098 of $213,800, which would fund the purchase of 100 pepper ball launchers and um, the 77 ballistic shields. So is there any council commentary on the special budget ordinance before we go to a vote on that? Council Member Kinnear. Thanks. I'll go first. I know everybody wants to talk. So we did have our public safety meeting today and we all asked a lot of questions. It took up quite a bit of time and it was well worth it. The item has been deferred a couple of times and I want to address any confusion around that. I recognize that SBD has waited longer than anticipated to make this purchase. However, many citizens reached out to council members with concerns, and we've heard those tonight, about how Pepperball would be used. As representatives of our fellow citizens, council members have the duty to ask questions so that both council members and the public have a full understanding of what's being considered. When we take the time to find those answers, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are in opposition. We are taking into consideration the safety of our citizens as well as the safety of our officers. We are investing in more mental health professionals, training, and other methods of de-escalation as was asked for tonight. So that is happening. I do appreciate Major Mike McNabb's presentation at Public Safety today. I know that was difficult for him to get, pardon the pun, peppered by all of us with questions. He walked council through less than lethal devices in general, and he answered specific council member questions about data, training, and the circumstances under which pepper ball would be likely to be deployed. The difficult decision for me um, after hearing the testimony tonight. But in the end, I am going to support the purchase of these items tonight because when used properly, it's a valuable non-lethal tool for managing suspects exhibiting assaultive behavior. And I'm reminded of the domestic violence situations that we've all heard about. If I was in one of those situations, I'd want officers to have the tools necessary so that I was not put in danger, nor would they be put in danger. And we have, it's not just about crowd control, but it's about those situations that there isn't another choice and you don't want people to die. So thank you, appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. Councilmember Cathcart, followed by Councilmember Stratton. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you, Council President. Um, you know, I, I, I look at public safety as being our number one priority as a, as a city council, as a city government, and something that we have to take absolutely seriously. Um, as much as I wish we've lived in a world where kind words can de-escalate and diffuse a situation, it's just not the, the real world and it's just not practical. And so I think we have to make sure that our officers have the tools that they need to both keep themselves safe as well as the, the broader community around them. Uh, we have seen an uptick in aggressive behavior and violent behavior, um, especially as we've come out of COVID, um, but it's always existed. It's always been there. And, and we have to make sure, especially after the legislature has made some changes in state law and in a lot of ways tied the hands of officers that they have access to these types of tools. Um, we all, I think, strongly support de-escalation as a, as a top priority within the police department. I think the police department would tell you the exact same thing. I don't know a single officer that I've talked to who would want to have a, a violent altercation or some sort of, of um, situation where, where violence, has, violence has taken place or he's had to, to use any sort of weapon, he or she. And so I, I just think we've got such an amazing, well-trained, 
police force, I mean, at the national level, they are one of the best well-trained uh, in the country. And we need to trust them and respect our officers and believe that, you know, they can do this job. And there's going to be more training. There's going to be, I think, a lot more that goes along with uh, these, um, these tools that, that we're allowing them to have. But it's really important that we make sure that they have those tools. And one person mentioned earlier the, the bowler wrap. I would love to see those, too. I mean, I think that's a really innovative, uh, unique tool that, that's uh, another de-escalation option. And I, I'd love to see officers uh, have access to those sorts of things, too. But um, the legislature specifically said that this tool is allowed and they've provided dollars that we can't use for other purposes. We can only use for this purpose. And so we need to put it to work to get the tools our officers have asked for, that they need, that they deserve to have uh, to keep uh, us, our community, and themselves safe. So I will be supporting this tonight. Councilmember Stratton and then Councilmember Burke. Um, first, I wanted to say one more time following um, Councilmember Kinnear that um, we did have a lot of questions that were answered today by Major McNabb, and um, it is true that they wanted one each, one of these launch, launching systems in each patrol car or in each car. And the, the big thing that I was happy to hear was the training piece, that there are plans for training um, every police officer to be up to speed on these um, devices. I guess the, the thing that's the hardest for me on this issue is when we talk about de-escalation and verbal warnings, what happens when that doesn't work? And as I've been thinking about this, I think, and, and I've gotten a lot of emails um, regarding this issue, and I had to think to myself, if my husband or my son were a police officer and they're out there every night, um, you never know what's going to happen. What happens if the escalation doesn't work or verbal warnings don't work? Are we sending officers out there in the community with nothing to protect them, with no last chance or, you know, something to fight with? I, I don't think it's, um, it's the only thing that we could be doing. I do believe that there are lots of other um, nonviolent ways of, of handling people, especially people with mental illnesses and all of that. But just from the human side of me, I just can't imagine sending people out there without something that if, if worse came to worst in the absolute worst situations, you have something to protect yourself. And so I'm going to support this, um, but I will say that I, I, I think we do need to keep communicating with the um, with our constituents in the community. I, I, I think there are many things that the police department can do better and we can all work together towards those. But for right now, I, I just can't imagine sending somebody out there without something that um, they could use as a last resort to, um, to get out of this situation. So I do plan to support this. Councilmember Burke. Thank you. So <clears throat> this is really embarrassing. The very thing people say about politicians is that we make promises that we're gonna do things and make hard votes and then we don't do it. We promised during the George Floyd pro protest that we would work on police reforms. What have we done? We've had a few discussions. I'm not talking about what the state has done. I'm talking about what we have done here in our very own community for our very own BIPOC community. Nothing. The answer is nothing, and this is embarrassing and sad. And here we are again giving more money to a force that has not taken any of this very seriously. We wonder why no one wants to join the police force, and we have tons of conversations about no, why, no one was, why, why no one is applying. Maybe it's because of the fact that our nation has created police departments to harass and jail black and indigenous people of color and to protect private property, which only supported white property owners. This is historical information, and the education is now out there to the people. So people my age and people who are younger who are now educated on these topics don't want to be part of a racist structure such as a police department. 
And now let me be specifically clear, because I get a lot of hate for this. I do not hate individual officers who work on the force. I hate the system that has been set up that hurts BIPOC community. That's what I hate. I do not hate individual officers. We need a big systematic change. And giving funding to a racist structure is not, not the right way to go. Today we are passing to give tools, a common, commonly used phrase, we are passing to give tools to our police department, tools that can only hurt part of our community. And we will hear about it. Will we hear about it in our, in our media? No, we won't, because the police department writes their own media press releases. We won't hear about this. This will not be public knowledge. The only way we will hear about this public knowledge is if somebody decides to pull a public record request on a video and or file a re complaint to our ombudsman office. That's the only way we hear about it in the police department, in, in the public. The folks who support who support this in our public forums and in the emails are saying that we need to protect people. What type of people are we protecting with this? Housed people, rich people, white people, people who have funding for mental health and health issues, privileged people? Yes, yes is the answer. It will not help people who are suffering with mental health issues, who are unhoused or who look different than the normal, typical person in this community. One more thing, why is our community, why are our police departments responding to mental health calls? We have a system that actually works. We have data and statistics on the fact that we have put less people in mental health uh, scenarios by using real mental health responders to these issues. That is where we should be putting funding into. I will not be supporting this and I hope that we take a step today and vote no to use this tool for our police department and do some real reform in our community. Thank you. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Burke. That's a lot to unpack and a lot of that I certainly agree with. When the pepper balls came to us, I was the one to ask for the deferral because we had not heard from the community and all the things that we mentioned, how they be used, how frequently, training, on and on and on. So thank you to the community. We heard a lot from both sides, emails and calls, and I asked for that and I got it. I will say, as a black woman, that I reached out to black officers over the weekend. And I asked them, I said, hey, what's with the pepper ball thing? That's exactly how I phrased it. And they said, Betsy, we need the pepper balls because that might just give us the time to not have to use another more lethal option going forward. So as I listened to them and the people who were on the front line and I hear you, Kate, we haven't done what we said we were going to do, but I'm not out there every night. And if that's what they say they need, then I have to listen to them. I bristled. I really, I'm thinking, oh, no, 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 no. But I asked them, and that's what they told me. So I will be supporting it, but I am asking what Curtis Robinson said that uh, the chief steps up and do that they could educate the community, they could have demonstrations, they can listen and get more from the community as how we go forward. That's the weak link, is the communication link of when, where, and how that they have not shared with the community. So again, you can call it a tool, you can call it a weapon, you can call it whatever you want, but if it keeps the officers safe, and it keeps one of my brothers safe, then I'm going to support him. You have any words, Council Member Mum, before I talk? It's up, up to you. Okay. Yeah, so I really appreciated everyone's testimony tonight, and I found myself uh, identifying with lots of people what they said, uh, even though they were on opposite sides of things. Um, I 
many people know that I, before I was on city council, I've spent plenty of years doing litigation around police um, issues and community members and mostly representing community members who were killed or injured by police, but also represented police officers sometimes who were accused of doing bad things. And I also represented the uh, Ombuds Police Office, Office of Police Ombudsman Board um, for a while before I joined city council. Um, I think that in general, it's better to have some less lethal tools than not. I have sat with families who lost loved ones because officers did not have less than lethal and they had the legal right to shoot and kill people because they were in danger and didn't have another option. And so I'm informed by that. Um, I also know that uh, just because something's less lethal it can still injure and kill people. And I've represented families who died, uh, had family members die um, from tasers being used against them, which are supposedly less lethal than shooting people. But if they're misused, um, they can kill people. And we heard some testimony today from the police department that if these types of weapons are misused and abused, um, they can cause serious injury and death. And I certainly resonated with Anwar Peace, who said his experience is that he's been, been abused by less than lethal weapons. And I don't doubt it. I've seen that happen. Uh, last summer uh, in the first George Floyd protest, that was certainly my judgment that less lethal means were misused. Um, and it comes down to what the policy is and what the training and whether or not there's enforcement on the back end for violations of use of force. Um, I totally resonated with Curtis Robinson saying it's got to be more than just a few more tools if we're really going to transform um, the relationship between police and the community. Um, all that said, though, I still think it's better to have some of these tools than to not have it, and I think fewer people will die and be injured. But at the same time, I would say that it's not a blank check, and they still have to be used within the law and within training and policy. And I wish, as Curtis's hope for Spokane is that police leadership will step up and demonstrate that really the best de-escalation are uh, talking with people and time and distance and very infrequently is it to use uh, a weapon even if it's a less than lethal weapon. But I'm gonna support this. And I see Council Member Stratton would like to t talk some more. So go ahead, Council Member Stratton. So I'm listening to all this discussion, listening to the people calling in, remembering and looking at my emails. Is there any way that we could talk about an amendment to this? And I know I'm going to be in trouble, Council, Council Member Tanier, but maybe we can think about this, that we would approve this funding for these devices but we need a, um, a plan, a solid plan from police leadership of, that there is a plan moving forward for police reforms. I don't know if it's appropriate now, but I'm just listening to everybody's comments thinking there's got to be a way to balance this and to say, you know, we'll support this, but I think a lot of speakers are right. You know, there hasn't been that big discussion on police reform. There hasn't been leadership out in the community talking to people. So is there any way that we could propose an amendment that says we'll do this if, but, but we need to see some steps going forward with police reform? Or am I going to get in trouble? So, so just... It's From a not. parliamentarian point of view, we already suspended the rules for purposes of late-breaking amendments, so those are appropriate, but it would take an actual amendment. But let me hear from Councilmember Kinnear first, but hang on to that. Councilmember Kinnear. 
Council Member Stratton, you're not going to be in trouble with me, but I would say that the best way forward is to approach the police leadership and say, this is what we want to do next and apply some pressure because this isn't the last request that we're going to get for weapons, cars, whatever else it is. We're going to get more requests. So let's tie that to any future requests to, hey, we want to hear from you about police reform and what you're going to do to um, engage the community and fix some of the things that we're hearing and that we heard tonight. So that would be my compromise to you. Council, I saw, I'll let others talk and then I'll come back. Yep, I saw Council Member Burke and then Council Member Wilkerson. Council Member Burke. So I'm not sure if we forgot our role as elected officials on the legislative side, but we're the ones that actually write the policies. So we can write those policies um, and vote on them. And so by passing it on to the police officers to do work, it's not appropriate. We're the policy writers. That's what we do as a legislative branch and we write the policy. So I'm happy, more than happy to work on an amendment right now to add to this to say, until we pass policies at the city council level for reform in our community, we will not give this money to the police officers for these lethal weapons, non-lethal, lethal weapons. Um, but to put it on the police officers, again, is us passing the buck saying, well, later when they ask for more weapons or more cars, we'll do it. We already did this. Like we did it when George Floyd got murdered by an officer and when more countless since then have been murdered uh, and then more protests happened. Uh, we kept promising the community that we would do it, and we haven't done anything. And that's what's so frustrating about this and what's so embarrassing about it is that we have said that we're going to do this. We keep saying we're going to do it, and we haven't done anything. And we allowed the mayor to take hold of it and say that she was going to have these policy discussions. She doesn't write policies. The mayor and administration do not write policies. We do. That's our job. So I'm happy to work on an amendment right now. We won't have the votes, but, you know, make an amendment to say until we pass police reform, real police reform that's going to help our BIPOC community be safer, will we give this money to our officers for weapons? And that would be my, my amendment right there. So, so move to that amendment. All right. There's a motion on the floor. Is a there second a second for discussion? Okay. There's a second for discussion, and then I saw Councilmember Wilkerson and then Councilmember Cathcart. Councilmember Wilkerson. I'm let Councilmember Cathcart go. I'm thinking. Okay, Councilmember Cathcart. So I, I'm not entirely sure what the amendment is. Is it just that some kind of mysterious police reform will happen at some point in the future, and and this is all contingent upon that? I, just. I think, we really, I think we just need to be really specific. What's the reform? What's the change? What's the thing? I, 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 I think last year um, there was a long list of reforms that were introduced by the council president, and I think most all of those and beyond were implemented by the legislature. And I think the, the commitment was that there would be a convening of a conversation of the community to talk about these things. There was never a commitment that I'm aware of that we would actually pass something. Um, and regardless, the legislature already has. And now there's even talk of them walking back some of it because of just, it, it just was not well thought through. I mean, this is stuff that really impacts our public safety. It impacts a lot of our aspects of our community and it needs to be thought through very well. Um, I'm happy to be a part of any conversation on this stuff. In fact, there have been conversations on this that I've not been able to sit in on and I would have loved to have been a part of those. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to be a part of a conversation, but I think if there's going to be an amendment to this or something that we pass about police reform, we need to be very specific as to what aspects of policing that we're going to be looking at and considering. And then we need to make sure that there is a very robust public engagement process that would include our officers and make sure that they're at the table, because after all, it's their safety. They're the ones that are out there every night doing this work. And so they need to be a part of that conversation as well. I'm 
first going to go to Councilmember Wilkerson if she's ready to talk, and if not, then I'll go to Councilmember Burke. Councilmember Burke. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. And uh, sorry, I did that on the fly here uh, of a of an, of an amendment. But we were given um, in in my inbox. I don't know about your inboxes. I'll just speak for my inbox. I got over three thousand emails about police reform during these protests, and we got clear specific policies from SCAR that they wanted us to work on. And we said we were going to work on them. We said we were going to talk about them. And we haven't done that. And maybe I'm not clear on my time or what we promised the community, but um, as somebody who wrote those emails back and, and heard the people, I definitely said, yes, I want to work on those reforms. Um, and we haven't gotten anywhere, and we can't rely on the legislature to do all of the work. We're a legislative branch as well. We work for the people of Spokane. They work for the people of Washington State. It's a different jurisdiction. It's, yeah, sure, some of our people fall into that category, but we have our own responsibility to our BIPOC community who loud and clear told us that they wanted reform, that they did not feel comfortable, and that they would not let their family members who don't live here move here because they were scared of it. That's what I heard loud and clear in my inbox. And so I would suggest that to um, better give clarification to the amendment, we work with organizations like SCAR and the Carl Maxey Center and the MLK Center and all of those, the people who emailed in, the community members who are being impacted by this specifically impacted. I don't mean that they'll have to change their laws like the police officers. I mean, they're having family members get murdered. Those are the people I want to hear from. And those are the policies I want to work on changing in our community. Uh, Councilmember Wilkerson and then Councilmember Stratton. Thank you, Council President Dave. So first of all, SCAR has an amazing platform and we should be engaging with them in conversation. And yes, I will tell you, I have some fears. Um, not all police officers are good and not all of them are bad. But as a black person, when one rolls up on me or to the BIPOC community, I don't know who I'm engaging with. So there's actually more trust on my side than it is on the other side. And I will have to go further than Councilmember Burke. It's just not BIPOC. White people need help, too. So let's just expand that to the whole community. So it really is a conversation. The mayor started it. I know there was a couple of meetings. I'm like Councilmember Catcart. I had no idea what was going on, who the members were, if there's been any outcome. And so not only hold us accountable, uh, we don't supervise staff. You need to be talking to the administration to make some of those changes happen also. Um, Council Member Stratton and then Council Member Kinnear. Okay, so Council Member Burke, I was just taking notes while everybody was talking. And um, I don't know if this would be a friendly comment to your amendment, but, and I don't want to confuse this and I apologize. Um, but, but what I'm looking for would be something that says funding will be made available pending confirmation from the Spokane Police Department um, regarding community outreach and police reform activities are planned or are currently being planned for the community, throughout the community. There's got, I mean, I, I would ask for a plan because we've talked about this for so long and you're right, nothing is happening. And usually there, there should be an outreach plan and dates and when we should get those on our calendars for open community discussions and neighborhood meetings and all of that. And we don't have anything. I'm just trying to find a way to balance this and say, you know, I believe we need to keep police officers safe. And so I support this, but I also understand that you're right. Nope, there hasn't been any follow through on this. And so how do we hold feet to the fire to say, We'll do this in good faith, but you've got to get out there and and start talking to this community and um, all members of the community to to enforce or to to get these police reforms um, out there for discussion and 
um, you know, to, to at least guarantee the community that you're thinking and you, and you want to talk about it. Because I'm, I'm not hearing anything either. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. Councilmember Kinnear. I'd like to call for the question, please. So there is an amendment, if I understand the current amendment, is to make the special budget ordinance funding contingent on uh, City of Spokane p enacting police reform. I think that's essentially what you um, amended, and there was a second. To that, is there any more discussion before there's a vote on that? Councilmember Mum. I am not going to tie this decision to the important work of the police reform because I think it needs to happen in a separate action. And I understand why you would do it that way, but I, I think we need to take it separately. So I am not going to support the amendment. Okay. Oh. Any other commentary? All right. So the amendment, we're voting on the amendment right now to amend the special budget ordinance. All those in favor of the amendment uh, indicate by saying aye and maybe raise your hand so I can see it. Aye. Okay. All those opposed, nay, raise your hand. Nay. 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 Any abstentions? Okay. All right, so the amendment um, doesn't pass at this point. Um, but as mentioned by others, that doesn't preclude actual other actions of police reform that this council can do. And there is a, a list of things. I do concur with Council Member Cathcart that the vast majority of the list that's currently on our website was enacted by the legislature with the efforts of Spokane City Council members. Uh, it didn't just happen. We were uh, leaders, leaders on that. So, um, but they have not all been enacted for sure. Council Member Stratton. Okay, I'll be done right after this. I just want to thank everybody <clears throat> for having this discussion. Sometimes we're so caught up in the drill and what we have to get through and, and um, all the issues that we deal with, but I think this was an important conversation to have and that we were comfortable enough sharing our frustrations and, and how we feel about this topic. So hopefully, We'll continue this, but um, thank you for um, just allowing us to have the discussion. It's appreciated. Yeah, and I would echo not just council members being willing to have it, but the community members made some great points tonight. All right, so we'll go to a roll call on special budget ordinance 36098. Um, uh, council member Mung. Aye. Council member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Council Member Burke. Nay. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay. That passes six to one. That brings us to special consideration S1. A, which is the 100 pepper ball less than lethal launching systems. Um, any further discussion by council members on that item before we vote? All right, we'll go to a roll call on that. Council member Mum. Aye. Council member Stratton. Aye. Council member Kinnear. Aye. Council presidents and aye. Council member Burke. This is for B, right? This is for A, the pepper balls, and then we'll get okay, to the okay. shields. Okay, okay, Okay. Thank you, <laughs> nay. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay, that passes six to one. Uh, now at B, which is the ballistic shields, uh, any further commentary about the shields before we vote? All right, Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. 
Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Burke. Nay. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to one. That brings us to the end of our legislative agenda. We have three people signed up for open forum, and they are Sasha Sharman, Nicolette Ockletree, and Anwar Peace. And Sasha Sharman, if you want to hit star three. All right, and just a reminder, as you mentioned earlier, you wanted to testify about the FN 303 launchers because they were not on the agenda, but uh, any topic around pepper balls or ballistic shields or the special budget ordinance would be on the agenda and not a subject for open forum. Welcome back. You have up to three minutes. Are you there, Sasha? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Um, or, well, welcome yes, back. Good. You have up to three minutes. Thank you. I'm going to be talking about the FN 303s that were discussed at Public Safety Day. It relates heavily to the spirit of what you heard tonight, so I might touch a little bit on that. These capitalists, attorneys, and landlords that you heard testifying in support of the police are not the only ones who have been affected by the police violence. They're not the ones who have been affected by the police violence. We are out every week talking to and serving the people who are actually affected by police violence we see daily as they throw away people's lives in the back of the city's trucks. We have had to de-escalate situations and work with the people who are on the streets. The police have proven they are corrosive and broken the trust of the people uh, they will uh, be using these weapons on. Respectfully, Councilwoman Stratton, it won't be their son, your son they shoot with these less lethal devices. It will be the homeless person your sweeps displaced. I demonstrated during public testimony that le less lethal systems are more deadly than reported by the police. We can't know how many more times uh, they will be used. And giving the, tool, the police more tools that they feel comfortable shooting because they are, quote, less lethal only opens up the door to more violence. Not only did the police wish list include the power balls, but they keep pushing for more and more agenda items like the FN Free Freeze, which are even more deadly, as McNabb admitted. They know community leaders don't support this. Uh, they only have the support of police unions. Respectfully, Councilwoman Wilkerson, a black cop is still a cop. Their priorities are aligned with the cops, not the community, not with the NAACP, not with SCAR, the Spoken Community Against Racism. I spoke to them uh, before we committed to making sure, uh, b before we commented to make sure my opinion directly reflected the community as well. They agreed with us and told us directly, do not let council buy more weapons. McNabb proved at public safety that the police think the alter only alternative is to use deadly force. The solution here is not to give the police an alternative to a gun, it's to take the gun out of the question. Don't shoot people. Somehow we have managed, somehow the people we work with on the streets have managed. As juxtaposed against the current system, less lethal might make sense, but if council had any plans of enacting what they had promised last summer, these reforms do not. We have shown your hand too early in the game and proven this council is not committed to reform. As Councilwoman Burke explained, you have broken the promise. We told you not to trust the police. We told you, not, we told you to listen to us. The funding, according to law, can be going towards de-escalation measures, which uh, would put you in compliance. It can go to body cameras and dispatch reform, which we have been advocating for. I'm extremely disappointed that City Council only promised us that, that City Council promised us six minutes of comment tonight and cut it off at freight. Receiving the fu funding is directly tied to what you spend it on, and doing so only proves that ca Council is only willing to listen to the cops and not the community and what they have to say. Thank you very much. Thank, thank well, just one second. I just um, have been reminded by a couple of people that um, when you are addressing the council, please address council president and not individual council members, even if um, you're tempted to do it. And But I didn't repeat that rule earlier this evening, so that is the rule. Um, do you have anything further, council member Kinnear? Was that, that was going to be my ask. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. I got a couple texts about that, so I'm glad everyone's up on the rules. Um, Nicolette Ockeltree, uh, if you want to hit star three. Welcome back, Nicolette, and you have up to three minutes. 
Thank you, Council President Beggs. I just wanted to let you know that I am very grateful for Councilwoman Kate Burke's bold, honest, and fierce testimony this evening. And now I'd like to go on to my previously thought about open forum comments. I think I'm getting an echo. I might be wrong, but somebody might need to mute their volume. I am deeply upset by Mayor Woodward's use of city resources to film a message where she asked citizens to pray and join her and local churches in a march for World Homeless Day on October 10th. Historically, our local houses community has had a tense relationship with some religious service providers who have forced them to participate in religious services in order to receive basic necessities like a meal or a bed for the night. Many members of our LGBTQ plus community who have experienced homelessness have been brave enough to speak out about how they were harassed and mistreated by religious service providers when seeking emergency shelter. I spoke to one of my houseless friends yesterday who said she's terrified of who she's going to encounter on the tents during Mayor Woodward's march. She plans to walk as far north as she can to avoid the march, and she hopes she can get back downtown in time to try to find an open bed. My friend is houseless because she fled a religious cult in Idaho a few years ago, and her entire family has cut off all communication and support since she left the church. Her time in Spokane has been very difficult for many reasons, not the least of which is the lack of low-barrier beds for women, and especially freedom from religious resources or religious services in order to get resources. Some of you may remember her testimony uh, during a city council meeting a couple years ago. It was really powerful. Not only do I think Mayor Woodward's comments are insensitive to the trauma some of our community members are experiencing, but I also think the use of city resources to film and distribute her religious message was an inappropriate and unethical use of city government resources. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nicolette. And then uh, Anwar Peace is our last speaker signed up for open forum. If you want to hit star three, Anwar. All right, welcome, Anwar. You have up to three minutes. Good evening, Council. I'm extremely disappointed in the Spokane Police Department reading to kindergartners the book Sheepdog, written by Dave Grossman, the founder of police training Killology. That training teaches officers to desensitize themselves to kill citizens, and this warrior mindset which is not in alignment with national best practices of a guardian mindset. In fact, the book Sheepdog is the sheep in wolf's clothing as well because it's a slimmed down version of the Kellology philosophy. And it's my belief that the author of this book, Sheepdog, is using this book as a way of rehabilitating the image of Kellology and making it more palatable for the general public, as well as he's using this book for his sales of the Kellology training to other police department, which SPD has now endorsed. This Kellology sheepdog philosophy ingrains into peace officers that they should have an us versus them mentality when dealing with the public. With this belief of officers needs to have of the view of sheep, where we're so dim-witted that we as sheep must have these sheepdogs to protect us and not only that's the only way to keep us safe, which reminds me of my favorite movie, Training Day, with Denzel Washington portraying Dirty Cop, and his famous quote, to protect the sheep, you got to catch the wolf, and it takes a wolf to catch a wolf, which mirrors the book Sheepdog. So I'm truly sad an SPD is teaching our children this, as well as I'm deeply aghast that SPD is willfully and intentionally violating the city council's 20, uh, 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 2020 uh, resolution denouncing the Killology training, where it says no city staff time, money, or other resources should be used. So since SPD has flaunted that resolution, it's my belief the city council should codify that resolution into law by passing it into uh, an ordinance. Furthermore, SPD if they are going to continue this reading book program to kids, may I offer the following um, suggestions. Uh, the book Preaching to, Preaching to Chickens, uh, the story of the young John Lewis by Jaharbi uh, Israel, 
when we say Black Lives Matter by Maxine Clark, and something happened in our neighborhood by uh, Marianne Peplo. That last book is for uh, kindergartners, which shows the reactions of two families, one black, one white, after a black man was shot by police in their town, which in reading this book, I hope that officers and kids can comprehend the simple fact that black lives matter. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anwar. And that is brings us to the end of our meeting. Um, we'd like to invite you back to next Monday, the 11th. Uh, we're celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day, and the mayor is going to give her State of the City address to us as well. So we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, until then, take care of yourself, and if you can, please take care of someone else. We're adjourned.